This video is going to cover a, the essential element of a prosperous future for all from a different perspective than normal and of course those that are attempting uh, desperately to keep that future from happening or hold it back, delay it, essentially. Start with, according to Ballotpedia, uh, off Google. State capitals are home to the offices and meeting places of state governments. The word capital is derived from the Latin caput, meaning head. In the United States, the related term capital refers to the building where government business is chiefly conducted. All current state capitals are established by 1910. Now, the veracity or the truth behind that paragraph is suspect. However, it it would be nice to note that kaput is also a word for when something is broken, as in the vacuum cleaner is kaput. And that is, uh, I believe, a word that comes from Dutch as far as the breaking thing. But here, of course, it's talking about how state governments are a proverbial head. But what exactly are they ahead of? Now, capitalization according to Wikipedia, American English, or capitalization British English, is writing a word with its first letter as a capital letter, uppercase letter, and the remaining letters in lowercase in writing systems with case distinction. So that might be considered the, perhaps, head of the word. One has to wonder. Then we have capo de capi. According to Wikipedia, boss of the bosses, or capo di tutti i capi, or Godfather, Padrino, are terms used mainly by the media public fiction writers and law enforcement community to indicate a supremely powerful crime boss in the Sicilian or American Mafia, who holds great influence over the whole organization. The term was introduced in the U.S. public by the Kefauver Commission in 1950. And again, that's likely not true. Next, we have the Order of Friars Minor, Capuchin, Ordo Fratrum Minorum Capuchinorum, Post nominal abbreviation OFM CAP is a religious order of the Franciscan Friars within the Catholic Church, one of the three first orders that reformed from the Franciscan Friars Minor Observant, OFMOBS, now OFM, the other being the Convent Convent Tool, OFM Convent, from Wikipedia. And Cappuccino, uh, again, Wikipedia. Cappuccini from German, Capuciner is an espresso-based coffee drink that is traditionally prepared with steamed milk, including a layer of milk foam, or a head. Variations of the drink involve the use of cream instead of milk, using non-dairy milk substitutes and flavoring with cinnamon in the United States, or cocoa powder in Europe and Australasia. It is typically smaller in volume than that of coffee latte, and topped with a thick layer of foam rather than being made with microfoam. Uh, also, cafe latte is just milk and coffee because latte is milk in Italian. The name comes from the Capuchin Friars. Well, I would say more than likely it comes from the use of the word capo as being a head, which is where the Capuchins get their name from. But anyway, referring to the color of their habits, and in this context, referring to the color of the beverage when milk is added in a small portion to dark brewed coffee, today mostly espresso physical appearance of modern cappuccino with espresso crema and steamed milk is the result of long evolution of the drink. According to a popular but unverified legend, cappuccino was named after the Italian capuchin friar Marco da Viano, who contributed to the victory of the Battle of Vienna. And, of course, all of that essentially dying, like all the other things. But it does, at least, give a brief explanation of what a cappuccino is. So now, when we look up capucha, we find out that it's a type of head covering for the head that covers up the major part of the head and the neck and uh, sometimes the face. So that is essentially a hood. Capucha is the Spanish word for hood and equally Italian as well as Portuguese. Now, of course, in English, we refer to a hat with a forward brim, a ball cap, or just a cap. 
And this gives you a better understanding of what exactly is capitalism, being the state capitals and the cap as being a head of an organization. Capitalism is an economic system based on the private ownership of the means of production and their operation for profit. Well, that's one, one general aspect of it, but that doesn't really define what capitalism is in the context of what it really is, which is just a hierarchical structure with a head. In a capitalist economy, capital assets such as factories, mines, and railroads can be privately owned and controlled labor is purchased by money, wages, capital gains accrued to private owners, and prices allocate capital and labor between competing uses the supply and demand. So, of course, naturally, that explanation also does not really explain what capitalism is. It's entirely misleading. The picture over to the right depicts it a lot better, where you have a pyramid that forms up to a point or the head. So capitalism is essentially speaking the head. Now today what we have are heads of state that are not domestic, they're foreign. But either way, the idea of a single head running a, a large body, that is the structure of today. That's capitalism. <clears throat> it doesn't have to do with supply and demand. Supply and demand are, of course, uh, have an effect on the, the idea of a capitalist structure or head structure. But this word for uh, easier explanation would be better called headism rather than capitalism because the capital use word from the word of head is not translated. If you were to translate it, it would essentially come out as headism. So, in this context, <clears throat> with headism, we have the Barter Network is a commercial trading network of companies in the United States founded in 2006 by Bergensky Enterprises Incorporated, of which G. Jason Bergensky, President and CEO, owns 100% of the corporation's shares. The Barter Network has grown to over 700 companies. These companies trade among each other using a medium of exchange called a trade dollar. So while this organization itself is not a head, it could be viewed as a head of the uh, other companies, considering it's controlling them, and then its head is the head of the whole sort of expansive entity. However, in current situations, this entity would probably be considered the hand head because, in general, there's no or little little or no recognition to the individual, it's all about the juridical entity and its own character, etc. That's why when you read things that people think the organizational name or the company, rather than say the person that runs that company or organization because there's no recognition for individualism, simply for the head of the structure, like state capital. Operation upon joining the TBN network, members agree to accept TBN trade dollars instead of USD legal tender when they sell to another TNBN member. So we know who wrote this because they list USD legal tender. Trade dollars are electronically via telephone or internet transferred by the seller from the buyer's trade dollar account. TBN members also agree to sell their goods and services on par with their cash everyday selling price. So this incorrectly named entity called the Barter Network does not actually engage in barter. In trade, is according to Wikipedia again, because there's really not everything that you find on search results are all going to be regurgitating the same repeated paragraphs and the same things that you would find on Wikipedia, so there's really no point in doing any in-depth searches because it'll take forever to find something that says something different. Anyway, uh, barter is derived from baritor, allegedly, is a system of exchange in which participants in a transaction directly exchange goods or services, or other goods or services, without using a medium of exchange such as money. Or in the case of the barter network, their special currency, rather than USD legal tender, also a phony currency. Economists usually distinguish barter from gift economies in many ways. Barter, for example, features immediate reciprocal exchange, not one delayed in time. That's not entirely true. 
Anyway, barter usually takes place on a bilateral basis, but may be multilateral if it is mediated through a trade exchange. In most developed countries, barter usually exists parallel to monetary systems, only to a very limited extent. And of course, here they're alluding to what developed countries actually means, which means developed into a corporeal structure with a, a fictional entity for its head rather than an individual or human being. And developed, of course, meaning that they are controlled by the same internationalist structure. And uh, yeah, that's what we're looking at today. Market actors use barter as a replacement for money as the method of exchange in times of monetary crisis, such as when currency becomes unstable, such as hyperinflation or deflationary spiral, or simply unavailable for conducting commerce. So all of those are partially true, or some of them are just flat out lies. But uh, one system of barter, just to answer that part where it states about delays in time, well, the caravan system of the old Ottoman Empire was related or was a medium of exchange, you could say, for barter. And in fact, did have delay in time because you would have go-betweens who would set up deals. And so when that stuff was being moved on the caravan line, it has essentially already been traded for something else or was going there to be directly traded for something else when it arrived. And therefore, there would be a delay in time for the trade to actually happen. So, of course, what they're trying to do is dumb down barter to the simple idea of two persons going and exchanging some little diddly piddly thing like a couple of wood for maybe some some eggs rather than the barter that we truly see today which is behind the monetary system but relegated only to certain companies and corporations where they move large quantities of something and then exchange it for large quantities of something else and they don't use currency to do that but for the purposes of this video, we can see that the barter network is incorrectly named on purpose. And all of these things are attempting to obfuscate certain concepts, reduce or take out of the individual level abilities and, uh, and recognition of their effects, the individual effect, and, of course, also to form that head, headist structure, which we today call capitalism, but is nothing new. So then we look at the Silk Road was an online black market and the first modern dark net market. So here they've got the labels. It's bad. It's black. It's on the dark net. <laughs> it was launched in 2011 by its American founder, Ross Ulbricht, and that's not true, under the pseudonym Dread Pirate Roberts. Of course, they're not going to list the fact that Dread Pirate Roberts is, in fiction, more than one person, with the title being passed on, uh, coming from Princess Bride. And the majority of people believe or slash know that the Dread Pirate Roberts was not one person and was never actually apprehended. Ross Ulbricht, of course, is a legal, a legal fiction uh, designed to make it look like the... Um, the phony heads of state were able to apprehend and take down the website, which they weren't because many others popped up. Either way, as part of the dark web, Silk Road operated as a hidden service in the Tor network, allowing users to buy and sell products and services between each other anonymously. Not exactly barter. All transactions were conducted with Bitcoin or cryptocurrency, which aided in protecting user identities. Basically, the barter network that we looked at before. The website was known for its illegal drug marketplace, among other illegal and legal product listings. Between February 2011 and July 2013, the site facilitated sales amounting to 9,519,664 bitcoins. And of course, it's quote, quote, unquote, known for its drug marketplace because that was the pretext that they used to close it down because of centralized control over the internet in general. 
But of course, as soon as they closed it down, many other marketplaces popped up. So clearly they did not quote unquote, get the guy. Then Bitcoin is the first decentralized cryptocurrency. Nodes in the peer-to-peer -peer Bitcoin network verify transactions through cryptography and record them in a public distributed ledger called a blockchain without central oversight. Census between nodes is achieved using a computationally intensive process based on proof of work called mining that guarantees the security of the Bitcoin blockchain. Mining consumes increased quantities of electricity and has been criticized for its environmental effects. Then, in context of all this stuff, we have the phrase, put a cap on. To put a cap on something, to establish a clear upper limit for something, we don't put a cap on rent in the city, people are going to start being put on the streets because they won't be able to afford anywhere to live. And of course that's by design because then they want them to be put into low income housing, specifically firearms prohibition and other things put into the contract that are criminal. However, the idea of putting a cap on something is exactly what capitalism is all about, putting on a head. So that's interesting that it also has to do with putting on limits. Essentially limiting the capabilities of individuals in a structure so that that structure forms the body with a head to the body, otherwise the capital. So currently today, to explain those that try to put a cap on everything, essentially what we look at today is a centralized headist structure which controls everything, but specifically for this video, technology. The World Wide Web is centralized into the domain controlled by ICANN, which is I-C-A-N-N, -N, I believe. And I don't really remember what that acronym stands for. Either way, the entire internet, when something is amiss for this centralized head is control, it is removed, eliminated, or otherwise uh, damaged, shall we say, by the centralized structure of headism, of the individuals who are at that head, that center of it, and can control the whole system based off that concept of being part of a body where you're in the body but not the head. And most of us probably make up the base of the pyramid or the feet where they stand on our shoulders, as it were. So there you understand the idea of standing on the shoulders of giants really relates to them as being the head of the giant. Now, the first practical way that they do retain this control over the Internet specifically is through the use and the structure of servers. The servers are essentially not just the data storage area that require a great deal of power and electricity, of which most of us don't have the functional capabilities to have our own servers in the size that the corporations have them, or incorporated in body, corp being body, also not translated like head being capo. Well, the servers, they are essentially speaking the internet. They store all the information of the internet. It's not up in some fantasy land in the sky. It's contained on servers. And they also run the functions of the internet. In order to have a robust website or social media platform, you need to have servers, or in most cases, a server room full of many servers. And then each of those servers share the load, as it were, to each other. If they don't like something, they can go to their servers and just eliminate it, right? Delete it off the servers. And that, practically speaking, is how the internet operates and how it's centrally controlled and relegated to servers. Here from Wikipedia, a server is a computer that provides information to other computers called clients on computer network. That's interesting on computer that should have a on a computer network. This architecture is called the client server mo model. Servers can provide various functions, often called services, such as sharing data or resources among multiple clients or performing computations for a client. A single server can serve multiple clients and a single client can use multiple servers. A client process may run on the same device or may connect over a network to a 
server on a different device. Typical servers are database servers, file servers, mail servers, print servers, web servers, game servers, and application servers. Client server systems are usually most frequently implemented by and often described identified with the request response model. A client sends a request to the server, which performs some action and sends a response back to the client, typically with a result or acknowledgement. Designating a computer as server class hardware implies that it is specialized for running servers on it. This often implies that it is more powerful and reliable than standard personal computers, but alternatively, large computing clusters may be composed of many relatively simple replaceable server components. Next, we have cloud computing is the on-demand availability of computer system resources, especially data storage, cloud storage, and computing power, without direct active management by the user. Large clouds often have functions distributed over multiple locations, each of which is a data center. Cloud computing relies on sharing of resources to achieve coherence and typically uses a pay-as-you-go model, which can help in reducing capital expenses, but may also lead to unexpected operating expenses for users. Of course, capital expenses can also be called overhead, right? Overhead. Capo head. Definition, a European Commission communication issued in 2012 argued that the breadth of scope offered by cloud computing made a general definition elusive, whereas the United States National Institute of Standards and Technologies 2011 definition of cloud computing identified five essential characteristics. So today, currently, the primary opposition to this sort of putting a cap on the internet as it were comes from the idea of open source, which is a source code that is made freely available for possible modification and redistribution. Products include permission to use the source code, design documents, or content of the product. The open source model is a decentralized software development model that encourages open collaboration. The main principle of open source software development is peer production with products such as source code, blueprints, and documents, notation freely available to the public. The open source movement and software began as a response to limitations of proprietary code. The model is used for projects such as an open source appropriation technology, appropriate technology, the open source drug discovery. Open source promotes universal access via an open source or free license to a product's design or blueprint and universal redistribution of that design or blueprint. Before the phase phrase, open source became widely adopted. Developers and producers used a variety of other two terms. Open source gained hold with the rise of the internet. The open source software movement arose to clarify copyright licensing domain and consumer issues. So, yes, once again, Wikipedia coming from that specifically headist perspective. However, open source is not relegated to quote unquote uh, availability to the public um, or being given permission, as it stays. Products include permission to use source code. Well, that permission can come from anywhere, including the fact of having the source code. And this is, generally speaking, the biggest issue when it comes to multi massively multiplayer video games. Such as, shall we use the example of recently, at least in the past three, four years, a Call of Duty Warzone. Well, what happens is somebody gets their hands on the source code for that video game. And when they get their hands on that code, they are able to change things in it, just like, say, the agents can change things in the Matrix, because they have the source code. When you have the source code, you can give yourself abilities that nobody else has. All the people who have followed the corporation's structure and who have obeyed that company's control, that corporation or body. And then when the people get the source code, who can change it, they break the game. And that's a huge problem for corporations because their revenue is damaged when people stop playing the game because the game has, uh, which could uh, also many of them could be robots too, or computer programs that go in with the source code uh, additions and start ruining the game for all of the real players that are going in there. Which the same thing can be done, of course, in with the Matrix uh, movie. Anyway, when that happened, 
the companies and corporations usually change their source code in an attempt to shut down that type of thing. It pretty much never works, which tells you exactly what is the drawback of that head of system. When they put a cap on something, they are also putting a cap on their ability to combat unknown variables or things that arise which are beyond their capabilities and therefore that leaves it up to who could possibly deal with that. Only the counterbalance of those people who are invested in whatever it is without monetary motive, only they can counterbalance it. Unfortunately with video games today you don't generally have that counterbalance which is the idea behind Bitcoin mining where there's an incentive for those that will go in and fix problems on the network. So also in relation to this open source concept, we have Tor, the free overlay network for enabling anonymous communication. Yes, that explains it all right. <laughs> These Wikipedia articles are something else, aren't they? Built on free and open source software and more than 7,000 volunteer operated relays worldwide, users can have their internet traffic routed or routed via a random path through the network. Using Tor makes it more difficult to trace users' internet activity by preventing any single point on the internet other than the user's device from being able to view both where traffic originated from and where it is ultimately going at the same time. This conceals the user's location and usage from anyone performing network surveillance or traffic analysis from any such point protecting users' freedom and ability to communicate confidentially. And, of course, as usual, Wikipedia is using a whole bunch of words, but not really describing what talking about. And I say Wikipedia because if you scroll down, you're probably going to find out that it was edited by some IP address or some alias, and you don't really know who did it, because it could have been a computer program that did it. Or it could have been, more than likely, what I believe is uh, the work of extorted free labor from the school system, specifically the universities, when all that information is copied and pasted into textbooks, which the professor then puts their name on, and that's where Wikipedia articles are derived from. Phony textbooks from extorted free labor. However, the Tor idea, or the Onion Router, which is hilarious that it doesn't say that Tor stands for the Onion Router, you think that would be something important. It comes down to the idea that a person will, from their computer, when they send a package, they will encode it in layers. Now, the first person that it goes to will have one key, and then they will decode that one layer. Third person that it goes to will have one key, and they'll decode the second layer. And then finally, the recipient, the third, or possibly who knows how many relays this would go through, they will have the last key and they'll decode it. Then they'll get the first message. Then when they send it back, the same thing happens again. When they send it back, they uh, encode it. And then the next person in line has one key. They decode that area. Then the next person has one key in line. They decode that area. It's the layers of an onion. That's the idea. The onion router. However, the other concept behind that is decentralized non-limiting uh, function. However, this idea of the internet traffic relay does not fix the centralized control of servers with websites, and it does not fix the centralized control, the cap, as it were, of ICANN, the, which of course has to do with websites and internet domains and things like that. All it does is hide traffic, but it doesn't it doesn't free up the ability to use the internet in its full capacity in the way it should be used by individuals. And that's the reason why such a thing as the Silk Road and anything else that threatens the revenue towards these headist structures, the, you know, they can be shut down by these headist structures. And the one thing above all that they fight tooth and nail to keep from happening is their loss of control over the World Wide Web. So imagine, if you will, a future in which every cell phone is a server. Of course, when you make a claim like that, 
anybody who knows what a server is, usually, will laugh at you and say that that's ridiculous. Uh, of course, they would have laughed at people and said it was ridiculous when they said that a computer was going to be the size of a desktop when the original computer was the size of, say, two rooms and couldn't, didn't have that much compu computational ability. Also, if we imagine that cell phones in the past were large blocks that you would have to hold up to your, your ear and would almost be the size of your head. Now they have been reduced down and you can have a cell phone that is the size of a computer chip. That's a little bit difficult to use, but it's possible. Also, considering flash drives originally had very little capacity, but now we have terabyte flash drives. Not so hard to fathom that in the future we are going to have servers the size of a cell phone. Now, the implications for servers being the size of a cell phone, size of a cell phone, is pretty substantial because it will reduce down to the individual level all the controls that co corporations and the head of structure has. Their ability to eliminate people based off of internet domains and revoke their license or their lease of a website. When you have a server in your hand, you can orchestrate and build your own website. And when everybody is carrying a server, the shared computational power is beyond fathoming, as are all of the capabilities that can be reduced down to not only the individual level, but the open source idea of collaborative effort across the spectrum with no single lot, single control structure which can put a limit on the capabilities of the internet and the human populace worldwide. This also comes into context, this idea of a sort of decentralized or reduced down to the individual level. Sharing capacity that can be done in the background where even those that are using and operating on the devices aren't aware of it. And this idea we can find in computing a denial of service attack or DOS attack is a cyber attack in which the perpetrator seeks to make a machine or network resource unavailable to its intended users by temporarily or indefinitely disrupting services of a host connection to a network. Denial of service is typically accomplished by flooding the targeted machine or resource with superfluous requests in an attempt to overload systems and prevent some or all legitimate requests from being fulfilled. The range of attacks varies widely, spanning from inundating a server with millions of requests to slow its performance, overwhelming a server with a substantial amount of invalid data to submit to submitting requests with an illegitimate IP address. That's a lot of terms that explain very little and also do not accurately explain to somebody uh, what they're really talking about. It is tedious, just like everything else is nowadays, because of that head is control over the internet. Essentially what they're saying, or what they're trying not to say, in a simple, easy way, is that a denial of service attack is some a single individual entity from their system, the corporation, right, their, their corporate system, attacking another one, another network, with the resources that they have. And we're going to find out that they don't accurately grasp what a DDoS attack is. In, in a distributed denial of service attack, DDoS attack, the incoming traffic flooding the victim originates from many different sources. More sophisticated strategies are required to mitigate this type of attack. Simply attempting to block a single source is insufficient as there are multiple sources. A DOS or DOS DDoS attack is analogous to a group of people crowding the entry door of a shop, making it hard for legitimate customers to enter, thus disrupting trade and losing the business money. Criminal perpetration of DOS attacks have often targeted sites or services hosted on high-profile web servers, such as banks or credit card payment gateways, Revenge and blackmail, as well as hacktivism, can motivate these attacks. So clearly, one of the things that they hate above all else is the capabilities of a decentralized structure. They cannot compete with it. They inherently, as headist structures, have a limit on their own capabilities. 
and all of these things are written from that type of perspective. So the things that, that it's not going to tell you is that a DDoS attack usually is described as coming from a single network. All of those, say, computers on a university network, for instance, can all be hijacked or piggybacked upon by a original source starting the attack. However, what they never will ever, ever say is that imagine a singular network, single corporate network, all the computers on the network, all the people working there on all their servers. That can easily be shut down, especially if that network is connected to other corporations and other systems. But as the structure works, if you attack the head, the body falls, cutting the head off the proverbial head off the snake. And if you have a group of people on various diversified and different networks across the planet who all at the same time perform a DDoS attack, there is no entity on the planet that can resist such a thing except for another decentralized, coordinated effort of people across multiple networks. That's the only one that can do it. There is no corporation head of structure today that could possibly resist an attack like that. And that's why they are so afraid of it. However, if you're part of a decentralized unit or group of various people that understand cyber warfare, as it were, well, then they wouldn't be afraid of that attack because that attack will do absolutely nothing to them because you have multiple networks and multiple individuals across that network and all of them can limit the effective power of this type of attack. This type of attack is only a fear for headist structures, corporations, essentially. So, like I said before, if we have servers reduced down to the hands, the idea of the DDoS attack is just one drop in the bucket of the capabilities that will expand out to all the individuals, regardless of their tech savviness or not. Because if you have a server in your hand, then you can build your own website store without having to pay rent for it, without having to ask permission from some sort of domain uh, service provider. You can just take a pre-written program, you can build it all, and it would be self-contained on that device. Now, if you wanted to have a more robust system rather than something completely simple like that, where generally speaking today, the only people that can do this are the ones that are able to use Linux and have their own home server. Well, you would be able to have that store that you're building for your own purposes. You could have the computing power shared with other servers across the entire spectrum of the globe which would dramatically increase the capabilities for a single individual to do all of the things, if not more, that a cor giant corporation can do today. And the next thing that would be an implication for this idea of having a server in your hand is the fact that you could or organize and design your own social media platform, which would mean we wouldn't have just Facebook and YouTube and Instagram but we would have an, a limitless, right, taking the cap off, taking off the head, removing the head from the snake, we would have a limitless number of social media networks across the entire planet. That is hard to fathom today. Essentially, when you have the server reduced down to the control of the individual, it destroys the capabilities to put a limit on the internet by corporations. It is possibly one of their most feared futures because it will mean they cease to exist and they will become completely and absolutely irrelevant. And that includes all head of corporations, your state local governments, which are corporations, your so-called law enforcement, which are corporations, your city councils, which are corporations. And of course, the big ones that everybody would look at, which would be like Google and, you know, banks and, uh, well, essentially all of them, right? None of them would be able to compete with a world in which every person's carrying around a server in their hand. It would be impossible for them to compete with that. Also, if people had a server in their hand, then they could set up their own trade networks localized to their server. 
And if they wanted to have a more robust and expansive network, they could share computing power across all of the servers that everybody else is carrying in their hand. Thus, the computing power would be exponentially increased and all kinds of unimaginable trade structures could be formed across that type of expansive open source and decentralized network. In addition to the ability to trade, all kinds of shipping capabilities, the ability to transport things, would be taken out of the hands of the corrupt headed structures of today where you have individuals for their own benefit um, oppress and reap the rewards of everyone else's work. Well, that would be reduced down to the individual level as well, and they wouldn't be able to compete with that. And thus, anybody around the planet would be able to set up their own transportation system and mechanism. They would not have to depend on postal carriers. They would not have to pay for overnight shipping. They would be able to figure out how to do those things themselves using other people in relation to the network. And essentially, it would be an expansive idea of getting your friend to take something across uh, on a flight, shall you say, that uh, where they're going somewhere. So like if they're going to the other side of the country, then you send a little package with them and say, hey, can you take this with you when you go on your flight? It would be like that, but far more expansive and certainly beyond current fathoming as far as comprehension of modern perspective. So we imagine this server is the size of a cell phone. Cell phones will cease to exist as well in their current format because if you think about the uh, requirements for it in that type of world there's a lot of other implications about advancement in technology so in that context we should understand what some of the current hurdles are that need to be uh, dealt with some of the current obstacles towards this type of new technology. The first obstacle for this kind of technology would of course be power consumption or energy source. As it happens, we don't really have any energy sources that are quite capable of doing this. But like I said before, the first computer took up the size of two rooms and was only in the last century built and designed. And now we have all of that computing power and more in the size of our hand in a cell phone. And that had to do naturally with uh, advancement in the capabilities of energy consumption and use. As it stands today, there is a lot of effort to hold back the floodgates of energy innovation by all of the headest corporate structures of energy giants, so-called uh, like big oil, etc. Well, when the energy requirement is figured out as relates to servers, that's essentially one of the last nails in the coffin of the oppressive structures that seek to rule us today, the juridical entities, as it were. Now, the next obstacle uh, to this particular idea is storage capacity. Currently, the servers have to be pretty large, and you have server rooms in, in every corporation in, in, or every building, essentially. Some corporations have multiple server rooms, and each of those servers has a particular capacity. But as we see with flash drives getting down to a terabyte level, it should not be too long before those flash drives are essentially themselves servers. And once you have a server on a flash drive, it's not a long leap until that server is contained in cell phones as well, which of course then would cease to be cell phones and they would become something else entirely. Now this is the same idea as say the roots to a tree. The more roots that a tree has and the farther reach that they go, the stronger, larger, and more embedded that tree is, the harder it is to uproot. Of course you do also have root kernels and the root code uh, or the root uh, command a platform thing for uh, communicating with your computer, right? Sending it commands and whatnot, the, uh, what is called the root. But this this would be a more accurate idea of what a root uh, of a, a tree, the tree of the internet, if you want to call it that, would be the decentralized control of servers 
in which the roots of the system are contained on every device that everyone's using. Obviously, across the planet, if everyone all, all suddenly stopped using the Onion Router or Tor Network, that would cease to exist as a functional network because it depends on many users on it. And it's the same thing with this idea of servers. Currently, right now, because the head of structure is in control of the server system, if the users stop participating, the you know entity, the like say Facebook, right? If everyone stopped using Facebook, Facebook isn't going to go away because it's locally contained on the servers of the corporations that run it, the shared computing power of different server rooms. In this idea, if all the users, if every single individual across the planet stopped using technology, then yes, that would essentially remove it. Of course, it's more likely that the corporations will stop using and running their servers because of energy capacity and rundown, and they also don't have people to operate them on anymore. They lost the technicians and labor, etc. So they just kind of, the life gets sucked out of them, and so they die. That's more likely than everyone across the planet stopped stop using their cell phones and computers, etc. So another concept that could be applicable to this is the handshake of a cell phone in which a handoff is done between uh, cell towers. Well, in this context, you would have a handshake and a handoff done between people's cell phones. If every time you pass someone in the street or while you're driving, every time you pass somebody else, you could have multiple simultaneous handshakes going on and when you have the idea of a server that's reduced down to that level the computing power and capabilities and speed in which those handshakes can be done will be there there will be essentially no lag in connectivity because the handshake is not being done anymore via the monolithic structures uh, high up in the sky or or centralized control um, it will just simply be an interconnectivity it could almost be seen as a its own living o organism fueled and functioned by the collective of humans across the entire globe. Essentially speaking, this concept of the server reduced down to the hands of everyone, every individual level, will mean that we will essentially form an entire new type of communicative web or field a whole new sort of relative field versus not just the idea of a communication field of energy, of, of frequency, the frequency field. This would be something else entirely. And not only would it expand onto other fields, this would be the type of world in which the collaborative, generative areas and capabilities of innovation and expansive understanding will lead to the ability to create such things as intergalactic spaceflight. Because if everybody is without limit, is communicating, collaborating with everyone else, then all of those people who have these masterful capabilities, they'll come together and figure things out, which will then lead to better understandings of different concepts and, of course, construction of different and more advanced objects.